Creo que voy a coger el micrófono mejor. Bueno, buenos días a, a todos. Eh, veo muchas caras conocidas y la verdad es que me hace mucha ilusión. Bienvenidos al evento. No quiero llamarlo evento de Brexit porque el Brexit como tal no es un, algo positivo, pero bienvenidos. Eh, mi nombre, yo creo que me conocéis muchos, es Rubén García, director general de uh, Columbia Thread Needle. Y como dice el nombre, somos... Thread Needle y somos Columbia y Thread Needle, como bien sabéis, es una de las gestoras activas más con mayor reputación en, en el Reino Unido. Estuvimos pensando en la oficina si, si merecía la pena o no venir a hablar de Brexit, que es un tema bastante complicado. Y como sabéis, los temas políticos a los gestores a veces no, no les acaban de, de gustar. Y cuando elegimos esta fecha, hoy es 22, pensamos que, que quizás el 29 iba, bueno, si no una solución, y vamos a estar cerca de una solución. Como vimos ayer por la noche, si hemos aprendido algo de, de, en estos tres años es que del Brexit, es, es que no sabemos nada, o, o, es, o es bastante difícil de, digamos, de predecir. Eh, pero lo que sí queríamos asegurarnos, como, como gestora británica y con tantos años aquí en el mercado español, es de por lo menos poder venir y daros nuestra visión sobre lo que pensamos que puede ser una oportunidad de inversión, ¿no? con unas valoraciones en determinados sectores y compañías interesantes, con una libra, vamos a ver qué ocurre en estas próximas semanas, pero que creemos que es una oportunidad. Y para ello hemos eh, planteado un programa, creemos interesante, con dos ángulos completamente distintos. Hemos querido traer, por la parte institucional de, de la Embajada Británica, a Bill Murray, que es el consejero económico, al pobre Bill le vamos a dar la responsabilidad de hablar de todo el tema político y el más complicado. Y por la parte de, de inversión hemos invitado de Threat de a Richard Conwell, que es nuestro jefe de la mesa de renta variable en UK. Gestionamos unos 22.000 millones de euros solamente en equity en UK. Y por la parte europea, a Anne Steele, que es nuestra senior portfolio manager de todas las estrategias pan europeas, entendiendo pan europeas, incluyendo a UK en Europa. Eh, bueno, como europeo yo espero que se queden, no sé si se van a quedar o no, parece ser que no, pero sí tenemos, creo, una agenda hoy eh, muy potente. Voy a empezar, por lo tanto, a, invitando a, al consejo económico de la Embajada Británica aquí en Madrid, eh, Bill Murray, gracias por venir. Y lo que vamos a hacer en esta primera sesión es, nos contará Bill, digamos, desde un punto de vista institucional, su, su visión. Y luego vamos a, a tener un, unos minutos para que preguntéis eh, todo tipo de, de cuestiones. Y posteriormente, en esta segunda parte más de inversión, nos comentará Richard Conwell y Anne Steele las oportunidades puramente de inversión. Muchas gracias. Muy buenos días, muchísimas gracias a Rubén y por supuesto a Colombia Thread Needle por la invitación de participar esta mañana eh, en esta jornada tan interesante. Doy las gracias, pero sé perfectamente que tengo un papel complicado. Como decía Rubén, creo que lo mejor es dejar cualquier pregunta, cualquier comentario sobre la marcha de las negociaciones hasta pues, la, la sesión, la parte de preguntas y, y debate. Entonces, yo voy a intentar centrar mis comentarios pues, volando un poco por encima de, de la, del contexto político. Eh, en, es, en este sentido, quería resaltar una cosa que yo creo que en el debate tanto en, desde luego en España como en el Reino Unido, que muchas veces se pierde. Es, la realidad es que el gobierno británico, el parlamento británico, ha dejado muy claro que lo que queremos es un acuerdo. O sea, es cierto que según la legislación que tenemos ahora mismo en el parlamento británico, si no hay cambios, vamos a salir de la OE eh, de aquí a una semana, el día 29 de marzo. Pero también está claro que hay una mayoría aplastante en el Parlamento 
para seguir negociando y llegar a un acuerdo. Hace dos semanas tuvimos una votación en este sentido para ampliar lo que es el artículo 50. El Parlamento votó por 412 en favor y 202 en contra. Esto muestra que el Parlamento quiere un acuerdo. El tema, por supuesto, es qué tipo de acuerdo. En este sentido, eh, el Parlamento británico ha dejado muy claro que el acuerdo que llegamos, que firmamos en el mes de noviembre con la, con los, con la UE, no, no, es, no da garantías suficientes para conseguir su apoyo afirmativo. ¿Por qué? Por el tema famoso del backstop. Entonces, déjame hacer pues, un paréntesis y intentar explicar brevemente por qué, el backstop, qué es el backstop y por qué es el obstáculo principal en estos momentos a llegar a un acuerdo. El backstop es una póliza de seguro. Lo que decía el acuerdo de noviembre es que en caso de no llegar a un acuerdo comercial después de nuestra salida, en el caso de que, o sea, tardamos años en negociar un acuerdo, porque lo que sí tenemos acordado es un periodo de transición hasta finales del, del, del año 2020. Es el backstop lo que dice es si... Por entonces, si no tenemos un acuerdo, pues si todavía seguimos negociando, entonces se aplica una serie de condiciones a, a la situación de Irlanda del Norte. Y estos son realmente que tanto Irlanda del Norte como el resto del Reino Unido siga siendo parte de lo que es la Unión Albanera. Entonces, esto, esto quiere decir que el Reino Unido siga dentro de la Unión Aduanera, con el añadido de que Irlanda del Norte va a seguir dentro del mercado único. ¿Por qué dentro del mercado único? Porque el mercado único lo que hace es garantizar la libre circulación de bienes, servicios y personas y que esta circulación es clave para mantener los acuerdos de Viernes Santo del 98 sobre que realmente puso fin a los problemas en Irlanda del Norte. Entonces, para evitar una frontera física, una frontera dura, la condición era que Irlanda del Norte iba a seguir dentro del, del mercado anterior, del mercado único. Reino Unido, no. Esto en la práctica lo que hace está claro. Establece una frontera física no entre los dos Irlandas, pero entre Nor Irlanda del Norte y el resto del Reino Unido. Políticamente, eh, yo creo que es muy difícil, es muy complicado que cualquier gobierno, parlamento británico, iba a... A aceptar esta condición. Entonces, esta condición ha sido realmente el escollo más importante en las negociaciones con, con Bruselas. Y que, por supuesto, que las negociaciones actuales están intentando llegar a un compromiso, llegar, bueno, esta, llegar a un acuerdo uh, que, sobre este tema. Tengo que decir que por supuesto, queremos un acuerdo, pero como cualquier gobierno responsable, estamos preparados para el caso de un no acuerdo. Hemos activado desde hace ya meses planes de contingencia. Estos planes están muy avanzados en, en cuanto a intentar evitar trámites en la, las fronteras, en cuanto a garantizar los derechos de los ciudadanos 
europeos, hay casi 4 millones que residen en, en el Reino Unido. Y que, por supuesto, hace tiempo, hace dos semanas, publicamos eh, la política que vamos a aplicar en el caso de no acuerdo en cuanto a aranceles. Y en este sentido, eh, la cifra es 87% de las importaciones que actualmente estamos recibiendo de la UE eh, en términos de valor, 85, eh, 87% de estas importaciones van a tener arancel cero. Se va a incrementar el arancel, los aranceles solamente eh, en una serie muy limitada de productos que suponen en total 13% del valor de nuestras importaciones. Pero insisto, uh, estamos preparándonos para el caso de un no acuerdo, pero queremos un acuerdo. Y yo creo que eh, el acuerdo que firmamos en el mes de noviembre tiene dos, digamos, dos secciones. Tiene una sección sobre el acuerdo de retirada que cubre todo el tema de los derechos de los ciudadanos, que cubre la, la famosa factura que vamos a pagar por los pasivos, por las deudas que tenemos acumulados a nivel europeo. Pero también en este acuerdo hay una declaración política. Esta declaración política lo que hace es sentar las bases para la relación futura en política comercial, política de seguridad que vamos a tener con la OE. Es cierto que no es un documento que es vinculante en el sentido legal, pero es una declaración política. Como tal, tiene la fuerza de que todos los, países, todos los líderes de la OE lo han firmado. Yo creo que en este hay que estudiar con detalle. Son 26 páginas, pero ¿qué dice el, el acuerdo político? Dice que Reino Unido, el, la relación futura que vamos a tener en bienes y mercancías va a ser un futuro más o menos como eh, la situación actual. Va a haber aranceles Cero, no va a haber aranceles, va a haber trámites, los mínimos, en cuanto a pues, eh, controles en la frontera, certificados, papeles, papeleo. Esto es el, el acuerdo. El, el grado, digamos, de, um, o la ambición va a depender... Eh, en este sentido, en hasta qué punto Reino Unido está preparado, eh, va a aceptar eh, las normas comunitarias, pero nosotros hemos dicho claramente que en términos de bienes y mercancías vamos a aceptar plenamente el acervo comunitario. Entonces, en bienes, eh, en mercancías, y esto cubre agricultura, nuestra ambición es que no va a cambiar la situación actual. Y en cuanto a servicios, esto está todavía por negociar. Los dos partes han acordado tener, llegar a un acuerdo lo más ambicioso que la OE nunca ha alcanzado con ningún país. Y esto, por supuesto, quiere decir que en temas de servicios financieros... Todo está por negociar. Es cierto, es cierto que vamos a perder los derechos actuales. Esto lo aceptamos porque si no formamos parte de la UE no vamos a tener los mismos derechos de los socios, pero tampoco vamos a tener las mismas obligaciones. Aceptamos que vamos a perder los derechos famosos de passporting y que la normativa va a estar basada en equivalencia, pero está claro que eh, lo hemos dicho públicamente, que vamos a insistir en cambiar el régimen actual 
de equivalencia que francamente está pensado más para países terceros como para un país como Reino Unido con el peso que tiene la City de Londres. Entonces, el acuerdo, insisto, el acuerdo político deja muy abiertas las posibilidades. O sea, la UE decía desde el principio que Reino Unido no podría tener un traje a medida, un bespoke deal, como decimos en inglés. Bueno, el acuerdo político, francamente, es esto. Es un traje a medida que está por negociar. Estas son las muy buenas noticias. Las muy malas noticias son que todavía tenemos que empezar a negociar esta relación futura. Y estas negociaciones van a ser largas. Con Canadá, eh, Europa tardaba siete años en llegar a un acuerdo. Nosotros, la verdad, es que somos optimistas en este sentido. Pensamos que podemos llegar a un acuerdo rápido. ¿Por qué? La realidad es tozudo. O sea, nosotros ahora mismo cumplimos con toda la normativa europea. Vamos a seguir cumpliendo con la normativa europea después de salir de la UE. Lo que hemos hecho en el Parlamento Británico es una labor enorme de transponer toda la normativa europea a la legisla legislación británica. Entonces, en el día que, que salgamos, vamos a estar plenamente convergente con toda la normativa europea. Este no es Canadá, con cualquier otro país el reto es desde una posición inicial de divergencia intentar negociar la convergencia. Pensamos que es mucho más fácil negociar desde una posición inicial de convergencia total la divergencia. Esto quiere decir que tenemos que sentarnos, tenemos que acordar pues, en qué medida en el futuro vamos a cumplir con la regulación europea esto, por supuesto, insisto, en la declaración política deja muy claro que en, en bienes nuestra intención es seguir cumpliendo 100% con el acervo comunitario. En servicios esto está por decidir. Habrá pues, diferencias dependiendo del sector de la economía. Pero está claro que nosotros vamos a querer la relación más estrecha posible con la OE. Y que conste, que conste que realmente no quiero criticar, esto no es una crítica a la Comisión, estamos donde estamos porque el, los tratados no nos dejan, no nos dejan sentarnos para nega, negociar la relación futura hasta que hayamos salido. Lo que hemos hecho es aproximarnos, intentar aproximarnos en sector bienes, donde, por cierto, tenemos un déficit con la OE de unos 100.000 millones de euros. Y dejar para el futuro <coughs> la negociación sobre servicios, donde, por cierto, tenemos un superávit con la OE de unos 50, 60 mil millones de euros. En fin, eh, no he tocado para nada la situación política, encantado de intentar contestar a cualquier pregunta sobre el contexto político. Muchísimas gracias. ¿No le parece un fallo histórico para el Reino, el Reino Unido el, el Brexit? ¿Y existe una posibilidad de que haga una nueva votación el, el pueblo? Gracias. Ah. 
es la pregunta y suele ser la primera pregunta en todas estas conferencias y jornadas. Contesto a título personal y lo veo muy, muy complicado, lo veo complicado. O sea que no creo que en el Parlamento Británico que haya una mayoría para un segundo referéndum. No lo creo. En la política nada es imposible, nada es imposible. Eh, si al final acabamos con un periodo, si alargamos mucho tiempo el artículo 50, fijo que se va a plantear otra vez esta posibilidad. Insisto, a nivel personal, a título personal, no lo veo. En parte porque no hay mayoría en el Parlamento, en parte porque... La verdad es que no tengo muy claro que la sociedad británica quiere votar otra vez. Tenemos una sociedad muy dividida sobre este tema. Entonces, ¿cuál sería la pregunta? Lo veo complicado, pero insisto, esto es una respuesta, es mi opinión, pero no imposible. Thank you, Bill. Uh, si no hay, no hay más preguntas, vamos a pasar a, al tema de inversión. Thanks, a, th thanks a, bueno, gracias, a España, gracias por, por tus ideas sobre el Brexit. Eh, voy a pasar ahora a presentar a Richard Conwell. Es nuestro jefe de toda la mesa de renta variable de UK. Eh, Richard Conwell ha trabajado con nosotros desde el año 2010. Y es además el gestor del UK Income Fund, que es uno de nuestros mejores fondos de renta variable UK. Thanks for coming, Richard. Richard hablará en, en inglés, ya que no habla tan bien como Bill, español. Thanks for coming. You want the, uh, microphone? Uh, Buenos días, and thank you for listening to me in English. I'm sorry, my, my skills at languages are nowhere near uh, as Bill's. So the, the title of, of my uh, 30 minutes is What are you running away from? Um, because thank goodness I, I invest in the UK stock market, not UK politics, uh, nor do I invest in the UK economy. Um, it is stocks and shares that are listed in the UK stock market. And I think there's some great opportunities. So in the context of what's been going on, I'll try and give you a view on how we're approaching that investment opportunity. So I've just put here a, a, few, a selection of kind of classic newspaper headlines um, that you're seeing both in the UK but also in, in, in the US. Um, and uh, anybody living uh, in uh, the UK, whenever we speak to anybody, friends or family overseas, um, they, they, they sort of lower their voice as though somebody has died, and they say, are you okay? Is it all right over there in Britain? Uh, as though we're all uh, building our, our sheds at the back of the garden and, and uh, uh, you know, stockpiling lots of tins of baked beans. Um, and actually, uh, the supermarkets um, in the UK have reported that they have seen uh, an increase in um, buying of toilet roll and paracetamols. So we are getting prepared for Brexit. Um, but uh, uh, the, the picture there on the left, um, do you remember um, when we moved from the end of 1999 to 1st of January 2000, and there was a lot of hysteria in the build-up to that about the millennial bug, um, and the, the computers couldn't cope. And obviously, in the event, no aeroplanes fell out of the sky, life carried on. So I think that's the kind of mentality that we try and approach life uh, in, a, in a Brexit. So these charts are just trying to depict um, how the impact of Brexit uh, 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 has, has translated into the stock market. So on the left-hand side, 
that line going all the way down is UK equities against the world equities. So as an asset class, we have not been very popular and we've not been very successful. So Brexit, when, if and how it arrives, uh, is being processed very quickly in the stock market, that this is not landing on us from a clear blue sky, um, that there's been a lot of fear and anxiety and therefore you've seen a lot of money being uh, come out of UK equities uh, and being invested in other asset classes. And you can't see it so well on, on the chart, but if you've got uh, a hard the booklets on your desk, um, underneath uh, that, that uh, uh, line chart, um, there are bars showing the magnitude of the underexposure of international investors to UK equities. And they are as underexposed as they were in 08 when the UK banks were going bust. So you might think, oh gosh, Brexit is going to be a, a disaster. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a lot of misery already priced in. And that's why, as an investor, we think this is really quite exciting. Um, and on the right hand side, the bar charts. Uh, this is a survey data from Bank of America that they do regularly every month and this is trying to uh, uh, show the extent to which uh, investors are feeling positive or negative about different asset classes and you can see the UK uh, right at the bottom there. People are feeling pretty gloomy about UK equities. Uh, and Europe, indeed, more broadly, is, is uh, uh, in, in number two position as being least liked. So you've got weak sentiment, underperformance, underexposure to UK equities, and that makes me excited because there's, a, you know, there's a uh, from here. If you think at the best investments uh, that you've made for your clients, when you bought equities in 2009, it felt pretty uncomfortable. You know, the world was about to end, apparently, you know, the financial crisis. Or when you bought more in European equities in 2012, when we had the Greek issue. Or at the end of 2015, when you bought emerging markets, or when everybody was worried about China reserves. So it's, you know, we do not invest in news flow. We invest in valuation, and often, uh, the peak anxiety is a good opportunity. So do you remember this uh, chap, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, the US politician, and his famous quote um, about unknown unknowns and unknown unknowns. And I think in a way, UK equities are known unknowns, that we've known something's been going on and, and as Bill would have talked about, we don't really know how it's quite going to land, but uh, you know that we're being processed, and that's why it uh, uh, impacted the valuation of UK equities. And I think actually what happened in world stock markets last year was a reminder that actually away from Brexit, there are a lot of unknown unknowns that people had forgotten about and were caught out with. You know, the, the, the decisions of the Federal Reserve in the US on interest rates, the worries about uh, China debt. There are lots of other issues in the world beyond Brexit. And we can get a bit insular in, in Europe being preoccupied by our politicians. So I think that's, you know, a, a good way of thinking about it. And this is the kind of data I'm sure uh, you've seen before and you probably talk to clients about and it's it's the the idea that can you add value by market timing no you can't basically and that um, if you'd have correctly decided that uh, the crazy Brits were going to vote for Brexit then you probably would have sold all your equities but that would have been the wrong decision because the UK stock market rallied because 
of the weak sterling meant that dollar profits improved. Or if you thought Trump was going to get elected, you'd have probably thought that's not going to be good news. I will sell equities. Well, that would have been the wrong thing to do. So the, the chart on the, uh, the, the uh, right just shows you the magnitude of returns that you would miss out from if you, uh, if you were not invested in the 30 best days uh, going back to 98. So I think that's quite an important message, that if everybody's saying, yeah, maybe UK equities is looking a bit more interesting, but I'll sit on my hands and I'll wait for clarity. Well, if you wait for clarity, it could be too late. I think and it's a, a message uh, that goes back to the Greece uh, issue uh, or the financial crisis, that you have to start leaning in, compounding in, putting money to work gradually. Uh, you can't wait for an event for clarity. And just again, some sort of uh, famous data, you, you know, the, uh, the Galbraith quotes there at the top, that uh, any institution that any of us have worked for always employs economists who are really bright guys and they, um, uh, you know, they articulate uh, uh, what they think is going to happen. Uh, but they're, what they're best at is explaining after the event why their forecasts were hopeless. That's, that's their job, really. So uh, you can see here the, the forecast error uh, is very material at important turning points that uh, economic forecasts do not predict uh, the financial crisis did not pick up the recession in the, uh, the early 90s or the late 90s going into 2000. And this, this chart just shows you that actually, as a rule of thumb, if you invest in the economy which is forecast to have the lowest economic growth, then usually the next year as an asset class, investment returns are good. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, um, work being done over the last two years on the impact of Brexit, both on the UK economy and in Europe. And some of it might be useful, but I wouldn't uh, overstate its importance or uh, its accuracy. Uh, and obviously, famously, uh, the Bank of England's governor, Carney, uh, was uh, very, very gloomy in his uh, uh, views of the impact of Brexit before the referendum. And more recently, he's got uh, his uh, uh, economists at the Bank of England to run some more scenarios. And, uh, you know, they, they made headlines in, uh, last year just showing his fear of the magnitude of economic growth hit from a disorderly uh, Brexit. And, and uh, almost immediately, actually, uh, that was sort of dismissed as quite, uh, you know, poor quality analysis. Uh, it was assuming all things else are equal, uh, the fallacy there. And, you know, the magnitude of the hit, he thought, would be the same as the financial crisis. And it won't be, you know, uh, uh, that this sort of, so this does not help that sort of anxiety and fear that's built around UK equities. So yes, there are risks. Uh, yes, uh, there are scenarios which will mean economic growth is weaker or could indeed lead to recession. But the magnitude uh, uh, of some of the, uh, the, the fearful forecasts, I think, are overstated. And I remind you of the previous chart that actually economic forecasting uh, is quite a dim science. And when I talked earlier about the unknown unknowns away from Brexit, you know, the big issue and the big driver of stock markets for 30 years, really, has been the Federal Reserve in the US. And you'll remember at the start of last year, Trump was uh, um, very positive uh, on the uh, stock market in the US, reaching all-time highs and it was all down to his economic policy. Um, and, and then he uh, quickly got a bit fed up with the new head of the Fed, Powell, 
starting to raise interest rates, which weakens uh, the stock market. Um, Powell politely did point out that stock markets do not equal uh, economy, but in that context, it's interesting to try and make sense of what's gone on uh, more recently with the Federal Reserve policy. They've gone from raising interest rates to a normal rate, which was going to be over 3%. They've started to reduce their very bloated balance sheets uh, with quantitative tightening. And which of those uh, measures uh, cause too much tightening and cause stock markets globally to fall at the end of last year? And we don't know which of the two, and nor do the Fed. And so there's been a, a huge U-turn, no more interest rates rises, uh, and they're going to stop further quantitative tightening. So uh, I'm cautious about that, um, that uh, they're unpredictable, and that could change again. Uh, what's, what have they seen in the data, or are they just being bullied by Trump? Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why you've had this uh, return of volatility in stock markets. You went, uh, it was interesting, you know, the, uh, the, the VIX series that people quote as a measure of volatility. Between 2007 and 12, uh, there were five occasions where the VIX went over 40. But in this uh, sort of 10 year bull market, uh, volatility has been very, very low, dampened because of money printing, quantitative easing. So in the last five years, we've only had uh, one occasion where it's gone over 20. So it's a much more uh, flat scenario. And I think it's dangerous to assume that can continue, even if for now the Fed have said no more interest rate rises. Uh, don't, don't expect that uh, to stay the same. We could easily see interest rise some more uh, later this year, which is not what the market thinks at the moment. And I think also the, the other unknown unknown is China. And everybody thinks China is all about the, the trade tariff wars, um, but it's not, in my view. Uh, it is the fact that uh, the companies that we invest in who have exposure to China, when they come back, they say it has slowed down a lot, lot more than the official uh, uh, line would suggest. Um, and the magnitude of debt in China is, has never been seen before. Their banking system is more geared than anything we saw pre the financial crisis in the West. Their financial deficit, the fiscal deficit, is 10% of GDP. And we're worried about the US at only 4% of GDP. So, you know, there are, there are big issues in, in China, and it's not just about the, the trade wars. Um, and that's why I think Trump actually has more leverage, because China, for the first time in decades, is a bit more vulnerable. Um, and I think, in a way, you were, if interest rates in the US being on hold allows Trump to be more aggressive with his trade negotiations. But I don't, if, if he gets the deal that he wants, I wonder if we might then start to see interest rates rise again. I don't think you'll get both. I don't think it'll be, well, hey, everything's great. So I think that's, those are really interesting, massive things to think about away from Brexit. And the other, the other important issue to, to, to be aware of in investing this cycle is uh, the, the increased um, influence of quantitative uh, investing. So we, we, as active fundamental investors, are in the minority now that on a daily basis, when, am I, when I am buying or selling stocks, uh, I will find that two-thirds, over 60% of the volume in a given stock will have been done by ETF buying and selling, quantitative uh, investors. 
So, you know, if you include index uh, and quantitative, then that's 60% of assets in the US stock market, uh, maybe a bit less in Europe, but it's, it's a very big influence. So I think that also uh, accounts for the magnitude of the fall in stock markets in December and the way they bounced so uh, violently in January or February. Because uh, the, the bottom right, uh, I think the phrase I'd use is it's like a valve, that the, this sort of money is all momentum driven is all pointing at the same direction and they're all trying to make the same move at the same time and if they're trying to get in or out and it's a valve then it, it you know it uh, overextends the direction of where the markets went in December down or in January up so that's a, an important influence so when you read uh, the stock market commentary uh, in the newspaper it's trying to make sense of what happened the day before, um, but actually it could just be machines. It, it, it's sort of supposed to be smart money, but in many ways it's dumb. You know, it, it's it's just following trends. So we're trying to compete with the machines uh, and exploit the opportunities that they present us. So in a Brexit world, if a politician says something, immediately it gets translated into a change in the currency, sterling, and immediately quant money gets to work buying or selling bundles of stocks in ETFs. So there's an ETF you can buy from Morgan Stanley of all the Brexit victim stocks, and immediately you see all these stocks weaken uh, you know, two days ago. Um, and that we can pick off which of those stocks we like and buy more of. That g gives us a really good opportunity. So the UK market is now, as I say, very cheap. So on the left-hand side, the bar chart is just a combination of uh, the price to the earnings, uh, the dividend yield, and the price to book. So there's no one ratio that you would uh, rely on, but as a sense check, using all three of those classic standard measures, the UK on a 10-year view is, is uh, you know, very cheap relative to, to what it has been in the past. And the line chart on the uh, right is showing the, just the price to book of the UK market against the US market. Now, yes, we would all pay more for exposure to the US market. It's a more dynamic market. Uh, there's uh, fabulous, fast-growing technology companies. But there's a price for everything. And the price now in the US relative to the UK is three standard deviations you know, more expensive than it's ever been before. So the elastic has got very stretched. A di different way of looking at it, just in terms of equities against bonds and the risk premium. And again, that looks uh, to, to signal uh, UK equities very cheap. So this is a slide. Uh, when I, I go up and down uh, the UK and see my clients in small towns um, in Britain, uh, this is the chart that I show them, uh, just to try and cheer them up. That uh, it's sort of, it's trying to depict that uh, that kind of quant ETF uh, thematic momentum uh, trend investing is trying to identify which stocks that will become victims of either disruption from Amazon, the Death Star, or from uh, a, a radical socialist government, Corbyn, uh, let alone Brexit. And there's some stocks that sort of tick all three. <laughs> um, so we're not running away from opportunities of companies that could be impacted by these three big forces. And we do think there are some interesting stocks that could escape, uh, that could gain market share uh, can compete with the disruptors. 
So there are opportunities in that forgotten area of the UK stock markets. But there's a much, much bigger uh, opportunity set that the UK stock markets is home to a, a large number of international companies that happen to be listed on the UK stock market but have very little economic exposure to the UK economy. They might be hotel companies, they might be oil, they might be insurance, food producers, but all of them trade cheaper than their rivals that are uh, listed in the Euro stocks or in the US S&P. And the reason is that weight of money that has come out of the UK index has depressed valuations everywhere. So you don't need to have a view on Brexit economically to be able to identify really good, cheap valuation opportunities on the UK stock market. And that's why in the UK you've got a, a big increase in the number of activists building up positions in UK stocks. They don't know what on earth is going on with Brexit, but the valuation cushion means that they are attracted to buying now in UK stocks. And I think as soon as we do get uh, resolution, clarity at the next stage of this process on Brexit, then I do think we will have more corporate activity, more takeovers of UK stocks. So the chart on the left is a global data showing that the number of deals always is higher towards the end of an economic cycle, not at the start. So in the US, lots of companies access to very cheap debt. Their shares are trading at all-time highs. Maybe they're worried global ec economic growth is, is more uncertain. Great opportunity to augment their business is by buying a rival uh, in the UK. So I do think we will get more deals, and that's, that's an underpin of valuation. So there is a valuation arbitrage, and if investors ignore the UK stock market, then businesses, corporates, and activists will, uh, will, will exploit that opportunity. So I think I'm running out. Have I got any? Five, I've got ten minutes. Five, five, I've got five minutes. Sorry, I'm going on. Brexit. I could talk forever. <laughs> um, so just hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavour of how we're approaching UK equities and some of the bigger picture issues that are out there. If I, if I just literally spend uh, three or four minutes just sort of giving you a flavour of, of what I'm trying to do with my fund. Um, so although it's an income fund and it, it is, as Ruben said, one of our flagship funds, um, and it's been, uh, you know, it's got a, a long-term track record. Income um, as a strategy is well established in a mature market like the UK equities, but it's not all just about income uh, and a dividend yield, um, that we want to uh, deliver attractive total returns, risk-adjusted, obviously. So that's, that's a different way of looking at the performance just year by year, uh, this cycle. Um, so what's interesting is that for five years at the start of the cycle, having done relatively well insulating clients when markets were very weak in 08, we actually were on the, the front foot. We were able to generate strong returns in rising markets better than the index and better than other funds we compete against. The interesting thing in recent years, you can see it's more volatile. And I, you know, that, I'm relaxed about that. In a way, that's more normal, that uh, the, you know, the really famous uh, investors through history with phenomenal track records, one year in three, they underperform their index. To be an active manager, you have to do something different from the index. And that means, you know, there will be periods when you underperform. I do not want to have a fund that just rides the waves 
and does great every year in every scenario. It, the crucial thing is that when your level of conviction, your uh, fund, uh, stocks that you are investing in do well, you need to have enough of them to make a difference so that over rolling three, rolling five years, you would build up an attractive return. So in 17, this fund looked to have not done very well, and there was nothing I was doing. It was just that the only thing in the UK market that was doing well was oil and mining stocks, which I have little exposure to. And in 18, it wasn't that I suddenly rediscovered form. It was just that the market, you know, in more volatile times, my type of fund that does not mimic the index uh, uh, showed itself uh, to be more resilient, more differentiated. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's the, the challenge, really, is that the fund shape is not uh, predicting a particular Brexit outcome. It's not beholden to the macro or the political situation. It is about doing work at the stock level. Where are the valuation arbitrage opportunities? And being patient. You know, trying to build up a portfolio. Sorry. We're trying to build up a portfolio that has good balance. So I'm trying to identify interesting, unloved uh, new ideas and build those up, but, but once they've started to improve as businesses and the share price uh, uh, rises, I will be happy to carry on owning them as well as they become compounders. So I get that combination really, so that's, that's important. So I think, just given that I'm running out of time, um, just the summary really is that, remember the UK, you might feel gloomy and nervous about uh, UK equities, but we're at a 30-year low relative to the world index. So a lot of that gloom and anxiety is getting priced in already. There are other issues in the world beyond Brexit. So the opportunity cost of not owning UK equities now is very different to what it was two years ago. Um, and we are not just uh, investing in the index. This is not all about some oil companies and some banks. We are finding lots of opportunities um, uh, in international companies uh, across the index. And also, we are buying some uh, more UK uh, domestic companies that the market is very fearful of. Um, because the, the valuations are trading as though they're already in a recession. So that makes us excited and we want to go against the, the crowd, if you like, in building up positions then. So the final, sorry, fi the final, when, when uh, the Brits, or particularly the English, are in trouble, when our football team lets us down yet again, we always wield out a Winston Churchill quote. So I better, I better wield out a Winston Churchill quote. So. So uh, at the top there, that's the obligatory Winston Churchill quotes. Just uh, this is a process that we're going through. Um, and we may have misgivings about how our politicians have tried to deal with it. We may have uh, misgivings and be perplexed about the original referendum vote. But we've always got to look forward. And there's always good opportunities. Um, so I think that's. Uh, that gives a good framework of how to, to, to approach it going forward. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Richard. Um, voy, voy a presentar ahora a Anne Steele. Yo creo que algunos de vosotros ya habéis tenido la ocasión de de conocerla. Anne Steele es nuestra senior portfolio manager de todo lo que son estrategias paneuropeas, Europa más UK. Thanks uh, for coming, Anne.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I thought it was very interesting that we're sitting in the Wellington Room. We've just had a quote from Winston Churchill, and as many of you know, Arthur Wellesley, who was actually the first Duke of Wellington, was not only a very famous soldier throughout Europe, but actually he too was a politician, and he was a Prime Minister not once, but twice in the UK. So a very auspicious day today. Um, I'd like to draw some parallels with, with European equities, looking back to 2015 and 2016. We all know that quarter four last year was a very miserable time for so many of us in this room. And really, if you look at this chart and look at the 15 to 16 period, the European market really had a torrid time. The cyclicals underperformed. The market weakened indiscriminately, a little bit like these ETFs that Rich has been talking about recently. And recession fears really began to build at that time. And what we saw was that the industrials, the miners, the banks, commodities, etc., were all down at least 30%. The Fed paused until March 2016. The dollar stopped rising and China stabilized. And if you look at the pattern of 2018, I'd just like to highlight that parallel because we saw pretty sharp falls in the second half of last year, as you all know. We're now seeing a bit of Chinese stimulus, and as we all know, the Fed are dovish again. So as we turned into 2019, if you look at the chart on the left, uh, what we really sat down during quarter four and quarter one at the beginning of this year and decided was that recession was more than priced in. If you look at the S&P column, on the 3rd of January, 60% priced in for recession. Now, we've seen a bit of a bounce. Recession was never our core scenario at the end of 2018. And we used that time to readjust our portfolios and become a little bit more aggressive. I've given you on the right-hand side of this chart um, our GDP forecast and our earnings growth forecast from our very first macroeconomic meeting at Columbia Threadneedle at the during the first week of January. Now, we were a little bit optimistic, um, perhaps a bit more optimistic than the Fed on uh, US growth for 2019. I think they gave us a figure of 2.1, so excuse the rounding error. But more importantly for Europe, we actually kept 1.4 and 1.5, and our consensus earnings is between 5 to 8% for the next two years, a little bit above consensus, and we think because of currency. But again, like Richard, you know, when pessimism peaks, there's nothing left to sell. And I wanted to highlight these four charts because I think they're important. The top left is all about performance. European stocks are totally unloved and underweighted and underheld in most global portfolios. So European stocks are at 50-year lows compared to global stocks. If you look at the top right and valuation, Equity and bond yield gap is the widest in 100 years. The bottom left, the flows out of European equities are pretty dramatic. They seem to be continuing. So how, for how much further before there's nothing left? And on the right, bottom right, sentiment, and this comes from a, a, Bank of, a Bank of America Merrill Lynch fund manager survey that takes place every month, um, we actually found that the intentions for global equity managers to buy European equities is at a six-year low. So a bit of a warning, we're getting there. It's very cheap. Let's look at the next, uh, next um, couple of slides. You know, risk assets have really shrugged off pretty soggy economic data. We were meant to have the great global reflation trade last year, but it didn't materialize. And I think if you look at the left-hand chart here, there's no doubt that the late cycle um, period actually favours European equities because really we think that there is a chance that we will have a period where US earnings dip down but actually Europe stabilises and therefore slightly outperforms. Now this can be a short period at the end of an economic cycle and we're beginning to highlight that. And Europe is at a 22% discount to the US. So some of the things that have fallen you know, in the growth um, camp last year won't recur. If you look at some of the water levels on the Rhine, for example, the fantastic summer that we all had in Europe, 
um, it really dampened growth. It made it very difficult for those chemical companies to get their goods away from the factories and distribution became impossible. I think it's pretty unlikely we'll get two brilliantly hot summers, but who knows. We have had French protests and that has had an impact. So domestically, there have been real headwinds. There have been some tailwinds and I just wanted to highlight the Belgian Consumer Confidence Index, which for those who have been in the market for a long time, is quite a telling one. And actually, it still seems to be slightly positive. And also, I would argue that the momentum of PMIs in Europe is beginning to stabilize. We're not, we haven't gone into recession numbers, and they seem to be bottoming out. So one or two things, as Richard highlighted, could happen globally, which means that stabilizes further and could potentially turn. So just watch those numbers. But as we all know, Europe is full of worries. So what's on my worry list? Well, the first has to be politics. I know you have elections here next month in Spain. There are elections in Finland. We then have European elections in May. Who knows whether the UK will be part of that or not. At the moment, we're having lots of regional elections in Italy. It seems that um, the upshot of that is that the Five Star Movement is becoming a lot less popular, and it's possible that Salvini actually says, well, wait a minute, I, I want my own mandate, and that he calls an election, and therefore we have a, a more centrist, slightly more stable government in Italy. Although, remember, it is Italy, and they're quite prone to a lot of elections. And then at the bottom of that, I put the UK, because I really didn't know what would happen and whether we might also face a general election. On the change side, I wanted to highlight two things that will change. Mrs. Merkel retires in 2021, and Mr. Draghi retires on the 19th of October 2019. These are what they, we would call well-known theories, ideas, people that we can bank on for some sensible thinking, but they won't be there. So is this a worry? My second worry is this slowing growth. And we saw a couple of weeks ago the ECB and also the IMF cut GDP forecasts quite dramatically from 1.7% to 1.1% for this year. We've seen inflation reduced, and we've also noted the problems within the banks. Now, the banks in Europe really are a problem, and they still are a problem, I'm afraid, and we just need to recognize that, however cheap they are. And the need to avoid a liquidity crisis is still there. And I'm afraid Mr. Draghi has you know, issued this TLTRO, and this is not fixing the fundamental issues. It is purely for liquidity, so please remember that. So interest rates, economic growth, not particularly stunning. And the third, and, and this is something that is not often talked about, there are articles in the newspapers, you can Google them all, but it's money laundering. And we've seen a huge amount of money come from Russia through the Baltic states and I found a figure of 20 billion that has been quantified already. Through 732 banks across 96 countries using shell companies amounting to 5,140. This is a problem. And we don't know where that money is ending up. It could be in real estate, Madrid, London, who knows? It could be Swiss private banks. Now, last year we all knew about Danske Bank and the problems there. But I've given you a list of some of the others who have started to put their hands up and say, well, actually, we've got a bit of a problem too. And there is a crisis in here, and I don't know how that's going to end, so please be aware of it, but it's big numbers. My wet next worry list was Brexit, and you've already had two far more eloquent speakers talk about Brexit. I don't know what's going to happen. Sadly, I was a, a Remainer. I thought we had our cake and were eating it. I thought we joined a very good common market. I did not want to see closer harmony and all the rest of it. And I was somewhat worried when I went in September 2016 to Brussels to sit down with Mr. Barnier and Mr. Juncker to understand a speech that they had written at the beginning of September when they talked about this closer harmonization, etc. And I said, what do you mean by that? And the thing that he said to me was, but oh, everybody's going to have to be in the euro. At which point I said, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense to me. Do you really think the Swedes are going to join the euro? Oh, everybody has to be in the euro. So I then realized how difficult all these negotiations were going to be. So who knows where we go with that. Let's look at some of the positives. 
Richard highlighted Chinese reflation, and actually this is something that should have a favourable impact on Europe. You know, whether it's 6.1% GDP forecast growth, I have no idea. And we will probably get a little bit of a bounce if we get a little bit more on the trade deal. But when I look at the detail of the National People's Congress earlier in March, um, what, the, what the Chinese government is trying to do is to stabilize growth, to contain the risks, and to generate, and this was the new one, to generate urban jobs. And I think that's very key for part of that planning. So we've seen a two-year drive of deleveraging. It's coming to an end. But we've also seen steps to help the Chinese economy. And this has an impact on us. Now, this is not the big bazooka that came out of China in the fourth quarter of 2008. But some of these steps are really quite incremental, and they are going on. In a command economy, you can do that. So we've had VAT cuts of 3% very recently. I know that $120 billion will be helped, um, was spent to help stimulate the high-speed rail and metro system in China. And they've also had two trillion, remember, of cor corporate tax cuts. Now, what does that mean in real money? Actually, it's worth about 2% of GDP. So there is help, there is oil on the wheels there. And how does that help Europe? Well, it favors consumer stocks. You know, when I look at the millennials in China, um, 65 to 70% have a flat. When I look at that in the Western world, for millennials, maybe 20% own a flat or a house. So their spending power is really palpable. And I can see that in all the luxury goods stocks. I can see it in Inditex. I can see it in Hermes, LVMH. And that is where it helps Europe. But also, if you look at the European index, with this stimulus coming from China, within the European index, we have fairly high weightings in energy, in materials, and in industrials. So you can see that perhaps Germany, some of the industrials there, might actually benefit. I've also put just a picture here, because the details are clearly quite difficult. And, you know, when Tr Mr. Trump came to, to um, power in 2016, he was really at that stage, and his um, fellow politicians were complaining about the trading practices. So what he did was he, he launched an investigation in 2017, and then he imposed through various rounds about $250 billion um, dollars worth of, of um, tariffs. And these duties actually range from about 10% to 25%. Um, and it's over a very, very wide range of goods. So what we are saying here is that with the summits and the talks that are ongoing happily, we don't know all the details, at least they're still talking, I suspect the negotiators are grappling not with the numbers, but actually the adherence and how America can ensure that China is going to adhere to any deal that is, is going to be announced. So, if tariffs remain in place, actually it would reduce US GDP by about a trillion dollars. So it affects the US as well. And I think it's really quite telling that we're getting, beginning to get news through political and diplomatic um, sort of forces, if you like, that we could see something in either April or June. But if we do get this, stock markets do not like uncertainty, they don't like tariffs, and actually that would be a marginal positive. And I'm going to come back to the consumer because I'm going to say forget the gilet jaune. Paris in the spring really is lovely, and there is no doubt that many of the stocks there are, are benefiting from this. With lower unemployment, and it's still falling, I think in the UK it was a 70-year low number we got this week, and tourists coming from Asia, you know, stocks like Puma, like Adidas, the luxury goods stocks, but also the spirits stocks, Perno, Perno Ricard, and Campari will also benefit. So really, I know Europe is unloved, I know it's under-owned, but it remains cheap. And look at that dividend yield. There are many stocks in Europe where I can um, point to dividend yields of 6 to 7%. Let me give you a couple of examples. You know, this is a 42 billion market cap company, Pernod Ricard. It's run with a CEO who's a, who's, um, a family member, Alexander Ricard. 
And really, what they've been able to do is be innovative. So you now find it's not just gins and whiskies, etc., that they're selling. So that within Beef Eater Gym, Gin, um, they are now selling, and I checked in the hotel here, they sell the Blood Orange Beef Eater. So they're actually being innovative and really driving their sales through emerging markets and throughout Europe. And we think this is um, a company that has huge barriers to entry because aging spirits are difficult to replicate. So in our portfolios, we tend to have more of the spirits companies than we do the beer companies. I'm also going to highlight another company that we came across that IPO'd in October, October the 12th last year. And when I looked at this company, I was almost ashamed that I had neither heard of it nor understood what they did before. And it reminded me of the quality of Le Grand that came to the market in 2004. And that's pretty rare in Europe. But Nor Bremser uh, was run and um, has been built by somebody who is now 82 years old. He has one daughter who is on the supervisory board, but she doesn't actually want to run the company. Now, what do they do? They make breaks. They have 42% global market share in breaks for trains and for trucks. So they're not a big, expensive part of it all, but boy, is it important. Because if they don't work, there's a catastrophe. Their margins are over 16%. They have 35% aftermarket share, so very good cash flow. There is no debt. And given the stimulus out of China for high-speed rail and also in the US, um, there's no doubt this company is going to benefit. They spend about 6% of their sales on R&D, and they really are a leader in the world. So if, you, if it's one you don't know, as I didn't, um, I would encourage you to go and look at it. Montclair is a company that um, I have always been invested in since IPO, and I very much am um, in awe of what uh, Remo Ruffini has done. He bought this company 15 years ago. He quoted it about five years ago. And really, what he's been able to do is stretch a brand and build a brand globally. Um, you can see the, the sort of puffer jacket that um, is, is typical and what everybody knows of. But actually, last year, he also did something that was pretty spectacular. Because in luxury, you have to have newness, you have to have freshness, and you have to execute extremely well. Well, he employed somebody two and a half years ago called Roberto Eggs, who came from LVMH. And he is absolutely a master at this. And last year, they announced at their Capital Markets Day something called the Genius Collections. And once a month, they hand out to um, a, an eclectic um, outside designer to do some sort of range for them. And if you go into their stores, you will see this. Now, what it's done is actually hugely increase the footfall by about 30%. 70% of all the goods sold in Montclair are to first-time new buyers. So it's stretched this brand. Longer term, um, I wonder if he might become an aggregator. He might pick off another brand and bolt it on. I don't know. I did go and um, sit down with him, himself, his wife, and uh, one of his sons to look at the strategy for the longer term. But actually, I came away thinking there is a lot more mileage just being Montclair. And really, on 21 times, it's no more expensive than the sector, so one I would still want to be long of. And my last stock to talk about is Seeker. Um, this is a Swiss company we've been invested in for 19 years, and I spend quite a lot of my time looking at ESG, simply because I think it's, if you're looking at any company, you need to look at the 360-degree view of it. It's a 20 billion market cap company now, and it's a world leader in chemical construction. And I was horrified when I came into the office in December 2014 and saw that the family who owned, it was the third generation of the family in the company, who owned 17% of the shares and 52% of the votes, had unbeknown to the board sold that controlling stake to Saint-Gobain. And neither say the share price came down, and I thought, this is not right. Because actually, when I looked at Sangabar over the previous 10 years, you would have had 21% returns. In other words, a whole lot of losses and a few dividends thrown in. When I looked back at what we'd achieved in Seeker, I thought, this is a faster growing company that needs to remain independent. So a couple of days later, my phone rang, and I had a call from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they said, because I knew Michael Larson, the CIO there. And he said to me, Anne, I, I can see you on the share register. You're one of the, the big holders. 
And I said, yes. And he said, well, what do you think of the deal? To which I said, very politely, not a lot. Um, and he said, well, what are you going to do about it? So I said, well, I don't know, but I'm going to go back and look at the Articles Association and to see if there's a bit of wiggle room for us to renegotiate this, because it's, it was only the family who were going to get uh, a huge uplift and not the rest of the shareholders. So after some discussions with Michael, we formed a concert party with Fidelity and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And for the next three and a half years, we fought this deal. And it took quite a lot of investigating, quite a lot of time, number crunching. I spent a lot of weekends working on this. And actually, we had a resolution last year. Because the comp within Seeker, they had grown their earnings, grown their cash flow, and grown their business during those three and a half years to allow us to be able to buy out the family, some of saint -Gabin, lock up the rest, and actually ensure that this company remains independent. Now, that to me is worthwhile. I am not an activist, but our shareholders, or the holders in our fund, benefited by 225%. By us just digging our toes in and saying, that's not fair, it's not right, and so we look at all our companies in a very straightforward and holistic way. ESG is here to stay, it's very important, and to me, this was a worthwhile exercise. So we still own quite a lot of the shares, um, and delighted that it came to a good solution. I've given you some idea of the f one of the funds I run, um, you know, the, the sort of sector bets that we have at the moment. Um, you can see how underweight financials I am, even though they look very cheap. I can find some in the diversified financials, such as Partners Group, such as 3i, that I think are genuine good growth, um, but certainly I have very few banks. Um, and you can see the geographic split on the right-hand side. Um, the, the weightings, um, the top 10 are sort of varied collection of names. Typically, I would have between 50 and 60 names in the portfolio, and this was a snapshot at the end of February. And for the long-term investors, yes, you know, we, we've done all right, but Europe's been a horrible place for the last three years to invest in. And all I'm trying to highlight is to you, don't forget it. L keep looking at that valuation. Look at those macros, because there could be some positives come down the track. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. No sé si hay alguna pregunta en la sala para cualquiera de los dos ponentes. Parece ser que, que no. Bueno, muchísimas gracias por, por vuestro tiempo. Eh, Sabéis dónde estamos. Cualquier pregunta eh, a cualquiera de, de, de los del equipo de Columbia Threadneal que conocéis. Y de nuevo, muchísimas gracias y esperamos veros pronto.